Hi Tana, this is Nadia from zenonco.io and Love Heals Cancer. We guide cancer patients on adopting an integrative oncological treatment approach. We help them find a balance between med, uh, a balance between medical treatment and complementary treatment approaches. Uh, we help cancer patients with our team of oncologists, lab experts, nutritionists, and other healthcare professionals so that the outcome of the patient, the treatment outcome, is at its best. Yeah? So, in, in support of this, we also try to connect other patients with cancer warriors like yourself here today. You know, I will not call you a cancer survivor, you're a cancer warrior. So, um, with the inspirational stories and we try to connect them and bring the whole community together so that questions that come up can be answered, the queries and other inquiries can be made. And most of all, through this entire program, we try to make the other person who is going through their own journey feel that they are not alone, right? So mm -hmm. this entire story here, we have Dana here, Dana Kanan. And she is here to tell her entire story. The whole world is listening. Dana, take the stage. This whole story is yours. Take it. Yeah, I can't wait to hear Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nadia. So, um, uh, yeah, as Nadia introduced, my name is Dana Kanan. And um, so I was first diagnosed when I was around 32 years old. It was around in 2015. So um, before that, I had like a perfectly healthy lifestyle, worked out regularly, ate, ate healthy, and everything was fine. Um, also, I didn't have any uh, history in the family um, of cancer. Um, so, um, so one day when I was uh, just looking at the mirror, I found something that looked like a lump on the right side of my neck. Um, I mean, it wasn't very much visible from the outside, but when I touched, I could feel something different. So I went to the doctor and um, uh, the first biopsy we did was uh, inconclusive. Um, so we didn't know if, uh, if it was cancer or not. Initially, the doctor just gave me antibiotics and it didn't work. And then, um, uh, yeah, the biopsy came inconclusive. Um, then again, I went to a CT scan and then um, uh, did uh, a biopsy uh, uh, in multiple places on my neck. Um, so then uh, it was found that um, I had uh, thyroid cancer, uh, the papillary uh, variety. So oh, yeah. uh, the cancer, yeah, this, uh, the cancer was um, uh, in my thyroid gland and it had spread to the lymph node. Uh, so yeah. Um, uh, it was around January, February, 2015, when I was first diagnosed. Um, so um, following that, I had surgery to remove uh, my thyroid gland and uh, the, associate, the uh, um, impacted lymph nodes. And um, following the surgery, I had to do the radioactive iodine treatment. Um, so, um, one of the difficulties in the radioactive iodine treatment was I couldn't find, like I uh, did my treatment in Chennai and um, I had to have non-iodized salt for the treatment. Um, but uh, the non-iodized salt was banned in Chennai at, the, at that point. So it was very difficult for me to go on my lower iodine diet to prepare for my uh, radioactive iodine scan. Uh, but yeah, it was 14, 15 days. So yeah, I stayed through, sailed through it. I did have a bit of uh, side effects after doing the REI, um, but um, it kind of, uh, you know, subsided. Um, so after that, I um, moved to Canada to pursue my PhD. I was still recovering at that point. Um, I moved in 2015 and um, I did my one year follow up in Canada um, while I was, I was still, I was in my first year of my PhD program and I was doing the follow up scans and everything. So at that point, um, you know, I was uh, announced that I was cancer free at uh, that point. It was December, 2015. Um, then um, a couple of years went by, things were okay. I was having uh, fluctuations in my hormonal pills. I have to take the thyroid medication every day because the thyroid gland was removed. Um, there were fluctuations and they were adjusting the medications, et cetera, at the doctors. 
but there was nothing worrying. Um, and a couple of years back, in 2018, around August, around August 2018, I had a, I had a sore throat um, for around a month. Um, and I went to the doctor and I was like, um, do you think it would be a relapse? She's like, uh, uh, it, 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 it doesn't look like it because she touched and she couldn't find anything. She felt my neck. But she was like, let's anyway have like a scan uh, just for precautionary reasons. And we did the scan and there was a lump uh, which wasn't seen from outside. So it was caught quite early. So I'm um, grateful for that. Uh, yeah, because I had wow. no symptoms. Yeah, no symptoms. Blood work was okay and everything. So um, so the second time I was again um, diagnosed. Um, and uh, last year I went through the treatment again. They had a surgery to remove that lump. And then um, I again had the radioactive iodine treatment uh, last year. Um, and um, as we speak, uh, I'm having the one year follow up. <laughs> so, yeah, fingers crossed, hopefully everything uh, will, uh, goes fine. And um, during the last few years, um, yeah, I was working on my PhD as well. I started after my first cancer journey, <laughs> uh, like when I was still recovering. So I recently graduated a couple of months back. I also wrote a book um, after my first cancer journey. I was struggling with all the trauma and everything. And then I was looking for ways to cope. And I couldn't find like a resource that gave me that all in one place. Uh, I found a lot of motivational books, but I didn't find like a practical handbook on what I can do every day to cope. Uh, so. I decided, I read a lot of research and I decided, okay, let me write one for myself. It was basically my notes. It was nothing much then. Um, it was basically just, yeah, just my notes. And um, then I thought maybe it would help someone if I put it out there in the world. So um, after I finished my PhD, I got to publish uh, my book as well. And, um, and I'm um, happy to say I'm, well, as of now, I'm doing well health-wise. Yeah. Amazing. I just have no more words to say. This is someone who's not just beat cancer twice, who's written a book, and who's gone through PhD with it. Uh, it's just, I can only imagine what you must have gone through. But it is so inspiring because you have fought through it by not even letting cancer touch you. It has not touched your mental space or any of it. Like, it just came and went. It is amazing. It is amazing. It's so inspiring. Like, even hearing this, the way you're speaking with so much power and so much, I did this. I, it's just, uh, as, as a person myself, I feel so, uh, like, oh, wow. <laughs> oh, wow. Kudos to you. I really must say kudos to you. And uh, you're saying that those were your notes in your no in your book. Um, could you tell us more yeah. about your book? Yeah, so it is called uh, Falling Up. Um, the title of the book is called Falling Up. And um, the subtitle is Nine Ways to Transform Trauma into Triumph. Um, so I wrote it under the pen name Tasha Brooks because I wanted to keep it separate from my all my business writing that I do and my research writing. Uh, so I put it under a pen name. And um, so basically, um, it is about a concept called, uh, broadly, it's about a concept called post-traumatic growth. Um, so PTSD is more popular, post-traumatic um, stress disorder. Yes, Sorry. yes. Yeah. PTSD, it is post-traumatic yeah. stress, stress disorder. Yeah, so that is more, um, you know, known um, worldwide, uh, yeah. but there is another concept as well, post-traumatic growth. How actually uh, trauma survivors grow from uh, trauma? Um, uh, quite a bit of trauma survivors, trauma, they experience a lot of uh, growth. So for example, uh, for me personally, when um, things, um, uh, I mean, so many things were not going well, it, but it really put life into focus. It helped me really reflect and see, you know, what's important, why am I, you know, uh, stressing on all these small things and what really gave my life in it gives you an um, opportunity to step back. So uh, the book is about um, 
you know, how uh, people grow because of uh, trauma and um, what they have done, what has helped them uh, grow. So I was looking at all the techniques that I followed. One of the things was, um, you know, strong social support helps them in recovery and uh, growth. Um, and another is exercise, meditation, et cetera, et cetera. For me personally, uh, I think I did, uh, every morning I did three things. I did like, um, throughout this journey, I did like, I wrote three things I was grateful for every morning, no matter, you know, what was going on. Even if I've had surgery, I was like, okay, I'm feeling better today. Or oh, I could walk today. Exactly. Sure. Exactly. exactly small things right created happiness so i did three things i wrote well every day i wrote three things i was grateful for then i tried to take at least like a walk like after the doctor said i was obviously fit to do it uh, at least a walk or some um you know um low impact exercises which um, really boosted my mood because exercise actually um uh is associated with the uh, happiness creating uh yes yes, and yes 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 it puts your mind in a good move yeah achievement yeah, it, also, it puts you in a good mood and then i also meditated like a few minutes every morning um not a, anything like yogic style or anything but just sitting quietly uh, for some time and um you know not thinking about anything uh, for at least five to ten minutes so those three things that i did every morning really like helped me so it really helped me uh, be happy and um, uh, like um, to see the good and the bad. Um, yes, very true. Because, yeah, so um, I uh, so those are the things that I followed continuously. But the book also talks about other techniques that other people have followed. Like for some people, there's the technical expressive writing where they write quite a bit about the trauma that is impacting them, analyzing them from different perspectives, etc. Some people do art therapy, right? So there are different ways people cope. So uh, what I did was I looked at many trauma survivors who have successfully come out of their trauma. It could be cancer, it could be other kinds of issues, health issues that they're going through. I looked at them, I looked at what they did. Uh, that helped them grow from their trauma. And so I jotted down all those techniques and I started practicing three of them for my own self. So I didn't, you know, I, I wrote this in 2016. So I was like going back and forth whether I should put it out there or just keep it as my personal notes. Um, and um, finally this year, um, last year I thought when I was going through my second cancer journey, I thought maybe this could help at least one person, like, what's the harm? Let me put it out there. So that's when I started, you know, updating the book and publish. It's a very small handbook. So, and I published it this year after the PhD program. Yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> really. <laughs> beautiful. Beautiful. The whole journey itself has come to such a, such a, where you, all your experiences have been put out in that small book. Yeah. I mean, look at you. You, you, it's your notes. It's just your notes that notes that you compiled and put together. And I cannot. I mean, so it must be helping so many people. You're just saying it must be helping one person. It must be helping so many people. So many people yeah, going through it. My goal, like when I put out, okay, fine, it is worth for me even if it helps one person. Yeah. Right? Because it was like a very sensitive thing. Like only after my PhD, I started sharing it with outside of my close friends and family. Uh, mostly because I didn't have the time before that. And then I was like, you know, should I do it? Should I not do it? Et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, um, yeah, that was my aim. I'm happy if it helps a lot of people, but you know, my goal was like, even if it helps one, it might be worth the effort. Yes, yes. It, yeah. Speaking of which, you were just saying about your family. Um, how, were, how was close to them about this? Like, how did they take it? And what was their reaction? Yeah, so uh, my immediate family is just my husband and I. We we don't have kids. So, um, m like my husband was there throughout my diagnosis and treatment, and I'm you know he's been like such a source of uh, support and strength for me. Um, so you know I, he's my primary ca caregiver as well. Was my primary caregiver. So I'm very grateful for that, and I cannot thank him enough. 
for everything he's done uh, through both the cancer journeys and you know everything which has happened in the past few years. So um, he he he's been very supportive, uh, and also um, like uh, my extended family, um, my parents, and um, um, my uh, I have a close set of friends. They also been all very supportive. Uh, they always um, let me know that if I needed them, that I'm just a phone call. They uh, they're just a phone call away. So, um, because uh, most of them are away in different parts of the world. Um, so, um, they always made me, uh, made sure that I knew that if anything, uh, mm. just give us a call. Like, um, you know, we can't be there physically maybe, but uh, the emotional support and mental support that you need, we are more than happy to provide. And um, yeah, so we have um, Zoom calls or, WhatsApp calls, et cetera, every now and then. And um, yeah, so uh, so that's been good. And they played a, a big role as well because, you know, sometimes you, at that point, you don't know how much the emotional support means, but only when you come out of it and true. You know, see it, Very true. you realize how much, you know, that support had helped you through that uh, journey. Yeah. Very true, very <laughs> true. And... Um, did they know about like uh, once you were first diagnosed at what stage was it and did they know about it at that point in time yeah yeah they all knew at that point in time so I um, there was uh, this actually in thyroid cancer uh, my doctor said there was no particular staging as such um, for this kind of cancer so they knew that I had it in my thyroid gland and it had um, uh, spread to um, my um, lymph node um, uh, but the doctor also said that it is, um, you know, it's promising, and you know, because I'm below 45, and they were like, um, you know, you, uh, you would have to um, take thyroid pills for the rest of your life, but it's not like a more advanced stage. So um, they, uh, um, because I was just a year and a half into my marriage, I recently, kind of recently got married, and. Um, and it was all very, um, you know, it all sh happened very quickly um, because I was like perfectly healthy, et cetera. So yeah, they knew from right from the beginning and they were always checking on me. And the first uh, treatment was in India. So um, yeah, so my um, parents' family were there and um, uh, they would regularly check on me, and uh, my one of my fr close friends lived there, and she used to regularly check on me. And yeah, when I was, you know, ready to go out, um, you know, past all the in, uh, stage where I could possibly get an infection, like when the doctor said I was ready to go out, um, we all used to go out, and probably it was just like a restaurant or whatever. Wow. <laughs> all that also happened. When I was in Vegas. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Uh, yeah, so they were very, uh, all of them were very supportive and um, uh, they were supportive, and, but they were also not, um, they waited for me to like open up if I needed any kind of uh, support, not very pushy or anything. But they knew that when I was, um, you know, ready to share, um, that they were there for me. <laughs> That is all you need, I guess. I mean, that is what family is, right? Yeah. That is what family is. Wow. Yeah. So, um, if talking about the treatments you've undergone, you said your first set of treatments happened in India. So, wh wh when, where did the other set of treatments happen? So, uh, the first time I was in India, and then I came here to Canada. The second uh, treatment uh, was in uh, Canada, here in Ottawa, where I live. Um, so basically the treatments were the same, like for the first uh, cancer uh, uh, journey and the second one, um, the treatment was the same, uh, but it just happened in different places. Yeah. It's okay. like, oh, yeah. slightly different in Canada than in India, a uh, little bit. Um, in Canada, for I mean, in India, for example, before my, the um, re radioactive iodine treatment, they ask you to go off the thyroid pill for a month so that you have to starve all the um, iodine in your body. Um, and then um, then they give you like, the, then they do the scan. 
here there is an injection for that so that you don't have to go off the uh, thyroid pill. So it's slightly different, but the result is almost the same. Almost yeah. the same, almost the same. And uh, yeah, please go ahead, please go ahead. You were saying. Yeah, yeah, so it's just a little bit slight differences, but the overall treatment process is the same. Yeah. Overall treatment process is the same. And that's why it's all, I mean, from what you're telling me, you have undergone such a journey and the highlight of it is that it was detected early, right? Yeah. It was that, that shows that you have been taking care of yourself really well. That any, yeah. like, like it shows the self-examination that played a major yeah. role. Just, yeah. you know, uh, you didn't leave out the signs. You yeah. caught them early hand and you just went for it. And I mean, uh, for a newly married person, that is uh, such a thing happening would have been like such a shock also. So yeah. I can only imagine. I will say yeah. this again. I can only imagine what you must have gone through. But uh, and you've come out of it so beautifully. You 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 wrote wrote a book out of it. That is like the heights of it. <laughs> telling telling the world that no, this is my journey and wow, there's a lot of there's a lot of empowerment there. Thank you. Thank you, you very know. kind. Thank you. Know <laughs> it is it is what you have done. You should know it. Mm -hmm. You should know it. And I really applaud you. I I feel very honored, like to be talking here with you, to be sharing this experience. And even while we're talking, I'm we're literally going back to that, right? Aren't we? Yeah. Living through the entire experience again to have to tell me and tell everybody else also. Yeah. Amazing. It really is amazing. Um, Thank coming. You. Yeah. You were saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I said thank you. <laughs> yeah, it got caught in between. I'm sorry. Yeah. So um, you were saying about your caregivers in the hospital. How were they? Yeah, so um, it was um, 9, 95, 99% of my the, uh, care was given by my husband. So um, um, he was taking care of me um, throughout the journey uh, so yeah in the hospital at home uh, so it was um, mostly him and um, um, during the radioactive iodine uh, treatment after they give it uh, so basically um, you have to be separated from other people because the radiation could be harmful to others so we had like a two-bedroom apartment in India so um, I'd uh, stay in one bedroom and uh, I use one bath and he'd stay in the other one. So then um, he'd, um, like we had someone who'd come and cook for us. So he would um, uh, put it in the disposable plate to give it and leave it outside the room and I would eat it and put it in the trash there. So Aww. that was for 14 days, 14, yeah, 14 days um, after the radioactive iodine treatment. So um, it was mostly my husband who, um, did almost everything and again as I say I'm very grateful uh, for everything he's uh, done for me and I I mean as I said I can't thank him enough for uh, everything he's done um, so um, yeah so and throughout in the hospital after the surgery I think I stayed for less a week for or five for five days after my surgery the first time so um, my husband stayed with me and um yeah so he was my oh, he was my only caregiver actually <laughs> uh from the physical point of like point of view um yes emotionally he supported me uh but they were um you know uh, my friends as well who'd call up and see how i was doing and everything so yeah, but uh, most of my uh, you know he was my primary caregiver my husband yeah <laughs> that shows the love this so when you say my husband so much love wow <laughs> very yeah. nice very nice blessed Kiola. <laughs> yeah anyhow um i also wanted to ask you about the importance of what others would expect like what would they expect when they get this cancer uh, as as I viewers are watching it um uh, talking about the thyroid cancer what would a person expect when they get this cancer? 
So um, initially, obviously, it's very shocking. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, when I was diagnosed, I didn't even know that uh, cancer of the thyroid was possible because I, I, I was very naive. I knew breast cancer. I knew those cancers have more awareness. Um, but I didn't know that you can get cancer in the thyroid, um, to be honest. Uh, but, uh, one, but one of the good things is if caught early, it has like um, very good prognosis. Um, so, and... Um, the other thing is the treatment is very targeted towards the thyroid, like even the radioactive iodine, it impacts mostly just the thyroid, not the other parts of the body. Um, so um, one of the things I would say is self-examination uh, uh, is important. Uh, for me, it was both times caught accidentally. Um, so yeah, because like I had something which looked like a lump, not even from the outside, but only when I touched, so, um, and then I had no other symptoms. So, um, but, you know, but I still went to the doctor and, you know, to find out. So don't ignore, you know, don't think that, you know, I, I'm fine. And there's, there's this small, uh, just a small thing, which is not bothering me. Like, you know, um, take some time off, go to the doctor. It might not be anything, right? But you um, always, um, you know, get it checked out. It's better to be safe. Right, so um, better to get checked out as early as if you find something funny in your body, something different. Um, get right. checked out earliest. Um, right. So that's what I would say, um, because that really helped me um, uh, being aware of your body and um, you know going to the doctor uh, even if you didn't have anything, if you're not having temperature or you know cold or cough or whatever. Um, so that that. Uh, I would say that self-examination, um, um, you know, uh, and then um, going to your doctor if you find anything funny, even if you feel it's something silly or not something major. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, explain to us your lifestyle changes. What What was your lifestyle before this, and how has it changed right now? Um. So one of the things. Um, that has um, changed is like I have to take my thyroid pill every morning, yeah. right? So that that is one thing that has changed. And um, the other thing I would say is like throughout this journey, like when they were trying to figure out what thyroid pill was suiting me, I've gone through huge hormonal changes. Sometimes I'll be like, you know, the thyroid, uh, there's like hyperax, hyperthyroidism and hyperthyroidism. The, pills were not suiting me at all. They were trying to figure out the dosage. And for thyroid pill, it needs six weeks to, at least six to eight weeks, so at least a couple of months to, because it increases slowly and decreases slowly. So every time they said change a dosage, I'll have to wait for a few months to see if it is working for me or not. So what happened was um, I um, would suddenly feel like very super active and I, I, I can't sleep properly in the night because the dosage was not suiting me. I was, um, uh, I don't know if it's hypothyroid or hypothyroid. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, <laughs> it was um, that way. And then when they changed the dosage, I was be, like towards the other extreme, lethargic and, um, you know, always like tired, wanting to sleep, etc. So I was going be between these two spectrums like uh, for a number of years as they were trying to figure out what dosage uh, would work for me. So um, yeah, fine. I think I was going through that for like two and a half years or something like that. And then finally when they decided, okay, this is the dosage which is going to suit for it, or be suitable. That's when I relapsed. <laughs> so yeah. So yeah, so you will have like huge hormonal fluctuations for some people, you know, the first dosage suits them, and that's yes. fine. Yeah, but for some people, you have to go through this journey of, uh, you know, mm. your body will feel very different. So sometimes, um, you know, because I was used to being healthy all the time and running around all the time, and for me, it was difficult to accept that, you know, I'm tired all the time because of this uh, thyroid uh, dosage and then I, I started putting on a lot of weight again because of the thyroid dosage um, 
and uh, I was so frustrated. I'm like, I'm working out every day. How can I put on more weight? And I didn't know it was the thyroid which was causing the problem. And I worked out too much, and I had to go for physiotherapy, like with my knee because I'd worked out too much. So the thing is, you have to be patient with your body. So when I went to the doctor, they were like, you know, your thyroid is a bit excess, and that's why you are putting on weight, we have to reset it. So, you know, it's like a journey. You, like earlier, you might have had a lot more control over your body. And now your body is changing because thyroid regulates everything. Um, thyroid regulates how you, you voice, um, like uh, your weight issues, your how, how well rested you are, whether you sleep properly or not, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so you have to be patient, your body will be evolving. Um, so that is another thing um, that I had to, uh, that was different. The other thing which was different in my case was um, my voice after my first surgery took a long time. It was very weak for like uh, six months or so. It took me like around six, six months for it to get back to the normal mm -hmm. um, after the surgery. Uh, because of, uh, because it's very near the vocal cord and because of the trauma, um, uh, and you know, in, in this place, and uh, because of the surgery, it took uh, quite a bit to uh, quite a, quite some time to come back. So again, um, you have to um, wait for your body to uh, get back to where it was. And I would say, in a way, you to be honest, your body is would never. It's like a new normal, right after your cancer. So you're it's always, like a new normal. Yeah, so you always, um, it's going to be different. Um, and, um, but then you'll eventually learn what works for you, what doesn't work for you. And um, yeah, I think the most important thing, like I didn't have patience in my body, as I told you about my weight issues and everything, but you know, I, I only learned uh, because I was comparing myself to how I was before, but I knew that the same work I do at this point is not going to help me with anything because. They are, my body has changed. So yeah, so one is the thyroid medication, which you'd have to take for the rest um, of your life uh, if you are uh, if you have this kind of cancer. Second is you might have uh, huge hormonal fluctuations. Um, but um, I mean, you might be very fortunate. You might not have it. The dosage might suit you instantly. Um, and the third thing is, yeah, your body is constantly changing and um, you have to accept it. And um, uh, this is your new normal. <laughs> and keep, this learning. Is, yeah. keep learning, keep learning. Keep learning about it. Yeah. So these were the changes for me. I mean, isn't that something that everybody needs to accept right now that their body is yeah. changing constantly and we yeah. should come to that level of acceptance that we're okay with it other yes. than comparing ourselves to others and comparing ourselves to how we used to be it takes time it takes time it takes time yes we have because to be patient you used to something and you're like oh why isn't it working this way but then your body has changed now right so yeah it's not only big, this can this is true of not only of thyroid cancer survivors right it's true of anyone who's even aging probably yeah right it is, so, it is. Yeah. I mean, your experience yeah. you you can say this from your experience. You can definitely say this. It, it, and and it is something that is the general thing. Also, people are not okay with their bodies and the change that happens, and that's what yeah. leads to a lot of uh, other complications, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it's important. Like uh, for me, I learned. I also, I was also very impatient with my body, right? So, um, like I think gradually I learned to be very patient and kind to my body. I'm like, okay, if this is how the thyroid, it's going to take time. It's like, no matter how much exercise I'm going to do, I'm not going to, this is how I'm going to look. So, um, so yeah, so I'll have to wait out the thyroid fluctuations, wait for the right dosage uh, to, for me. So, yeah. So it was a lesson for me as well to be more accepting and be more kind. Uh, to my body and um, accept that this is my new normal. <laughs> In fact, that was going to be my next question to you. What were the lessons that you learned from this entire experience? <laughs> uh, yeah, so one of the other lessons I learned was um, for me when um, 
you know, this was life altering for me and in many ways, um, even mentally, right? So one of the things that um, I learned was when this happened, I realized what truly was important, you know, because otherwise, you know, we all sweat the small stuff uh, every day. And when this happened, I felt like it really made me take a step back and reanalyze, you know, what is important in my life, right? So, you know, I, and only two things came to me for me. I was like, I really want a meaningful relationship with people, right? It could be spouse, friends, family, etc. And I wanted to help others learn, right? I wanted to um, do work that gave me purpose. Wow. Right. So I all, always knew these things, but I think it take, took that traumatic situation to really bring it to the forefront. This, were, this was not like a new discovery, but it was something that, you know, when something big happens, then only the important things stay. Uh, everything else that you are so worried about, all, it, it feels so insignificant after, um, you know, uh, in the face of uh, you know, cancer or coming face to face with your yeah. and everything. So I think that was uh, one of the biggest things for me. <laughs> one of the biggest lessons you've learned. Yeah, one of the biggest lessons I learned. Yeah, mm. <laughs> amazing. And not mm. only that, um, the kind of gratitude with which you are talking to me right now is just resonating. Like I am sitting so far away from you. You're talking with so much, like you wake up every day with so much gratitude. You wake up every day with a second life in your hand. And no, I'm here for a purpose. I'm here to get these things done. And I have the fire. <laughs> there is so much of energy in the way you're talking, so much of life. And it's just resonating right to me, putting so much, the, when you're talking, the way you're talking itself is putting a big smile on my face because the, the energy is just resonating. <laughs> I must say this, yeah. Also, um, coming to the first reaction that, you know, mm -hmm. oh, I'm cancer free. How did, mm -hmm. how did, how did that, how did that go? Um, so the first time it was in 20, now I've not yet been declared. So I'm just doing my first year follow up. So the first time uh, in 2015 in December, <coughs> sorry, uh, in 2015 December, I was declared cancer free. I, it was a sense of relief. Mm. It was a real sense of relief because the whole year I was um, going through all the ups and downs. And um, I was also in a very demanding program. I was doing my PhD. I just started, right? So um it was a big relief that you know this is out of the way now <laughs> but again I relapsed in two and a half I mean in a couple of years but then at that point it was such a sense of relief uh, because it was uh, quite a traumatic um experience um not only for me because uh, everyone around you also goes through a lot of um, stress so I was, I felt like I was putting stress on everyone around me, especially my partner. So I didn't, um, you know, I was very happy that, um, you know, uh, I, I think the right word is relieved. <laughs> <laughs> Most, you know, very uh, relieved that, you know, this is behind me now, at least for now, because you don't know in future with, with cancer, but at least for now, um, uh, I was very relieved and I'm more importantly, I was very grateful for it. Um, uh, I was grateful that, uh, you know, I had this thing, but then I was able to, in spite of my condition, I was able to uh, uh, afford good treatment. Uh, I had good care. I had my amazing husband who took care of me and I had like a good support network. Um, and I didn't want to take that for granted because I know that um, uh, people, as uh, some people don't have uh, all the things that I had. So I was very grateful for everything that I had during that um, uh, period of time and also every day. So uh, yeah, I was relieved and I was very grateful. <laughs> every day waking up with a new smile. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> every day, the kind of, the kind of uh, you know, zest one has for life after that, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's the word <laughs> zest all right so um one more main thing that i wanted to touch upon was uh you spoke to me about your treatment in india 
how did this uh, you did your phd in canada so mm-hmm. um, when the treatment was going on in india was it a brief treatment in india that you went back and did your phd how did you shuttle both yeah so my treatment got over in um, april 2015 so yeah so thyroid cancer initially i had my surgery okay. and then after my surgery a month after that i had my radioactive iodine treatment so um it was still um very um it was not very advanced so those two things were um enough um so, so the surgery after the surgery the radioactive iodine treatment that was over in april 2015 uh, but i was still having all the side effects and everything I was losing a lot of hair. i thought i'm going to go like totally i mean like um my i mean i was losing a lot of hair uh because in radioactive iodine you typically do not lose hair but um, my doctor said that because you've gone through such a stressful time like uh, you know hair is the last thing that gets nutrients so by um april i had treatment as such was over mm. so uh after that um i moved in september but i was still going through my body was going through a lot of hormonal fluctuations i had like ex- like excessive dry skin and uh hair falling out and etc 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 so i was constantly going to the doctor my voice was not okay um so i was constantly going to the doctor but i moved in um august um so september was my uh, start of my course and then when i came here i started consulting with doctors here and um I, and i knew that i had to do the follow up for my treatment follow up uh, to see if the treatment in india worked um so i did my follow up in december that year yeah so i was still continuing it so whatever i left there um i came here and i still went to the endocrinologist she had to give me the proper dosage <clears throat> i was still work- they were still working on what was the correct dosage for me right when india so when i moved here again um that had to be sorted and all the side effects from the treatment that i was going through had to be sorted um and then um i had to do the one year follow up the scans the blood tests ultrasound etc so um though the treatment as such finished in april um i was oh, i think there was not even a week that i was not running to the doctor for something or the other <laughs> this is what made me ask you this question because how did you do phd with this it is how was it possible how did you manage that time it's just like you're talking to someone who has gone through cancer it's not some normal fever like you know yeah, yeah. that is that is i'm asking it out of in wonder if you ask me <laughs> so i remember like initially when i came as well right it was like i was, it was very demanding because and then i was doing this thing i was in the doctor's office multiple times i think a week uh, when i first came and then it was at least once a week so i used to take my laptop and sit in the waiting rooms the weird person sitting with the laptop in the waiting room <laughs> because when i'm waiting to be called i'll be working on something and then um i would um, probably if i take the bus i'd be standing there with my um phone and reading something i was just trying to make use of every time that was possible so uh, during my first time a lot of my uh, assignments and work reading was done waiting at the doctor's clinic uh, and the hospitals waiting rooms of hospitals so yeah i mean so how you manage and um, i mean if you really want it you find a way to do it right in your schedule i think all of us if we really want something we uh, find a way to put it in our schedule so yeah make it uh, so, happen Yeah, so I'm not different in that way. <laughs> yeah. We make it happen. It's not. Yeah. It's not the fact that you're not different. It's the fact that your determination and your motivation mm-hmm. is just incredible. It is incredible <laughs> that you know, cancer is not going to stop me from living the life that I want, mm-hmm. living the, the dreams that I want to do, getting the goals that I want to achieve. That is yeah. that is that is what makes you stand out, and that is what we everybody. people who are all out there need to know that 
you know, none of these hurdles need to stop us. It is a, it is a choice. We all have that spirit and that human endurance is just cannot be compared to anything else, right? Yeah, that's true. The, but uh, yeah, the way I see it, like for me, it was cancer. For someone else, it could be some other problem. It could be they might be going through a divorce. They might be going through some other health issues. Um, it could be mental health issues that they're going through. Uh, so everyone has their own battles and their own challenges, right? So everyone, I feel everyone goes through some some major trauma in our lives. I mean, mul- perhaps even multiple major traumas in our life, loss of our loved ones, etc. cetera. So, um, and I, I, I think most of us are very uh, resilient as humans. Uh, we bounce back, we get back to our day-to-day lives um, and we do the things that we want. <laughs> So, yeah. Getting there, making those goals happen is the goal. It is is the goal. (laughs) Right. And what would you like to share with all the viewers out there, you know, watching this as a story? What is your takeaway message? What are your words of wisdom for everybody watching this? Someone who has gone through such an inspirational story out there. Yeah. So, um, for any of the... um, people who are going through this illness right now. So I'd say first thing is stay strong. Um, the second thing is, uh, you know, your mental health also takes a huge hit uh, when you're going through this kind of a journey. So don't be afraid to ask for help. Uh, it, you know, ask, uh, tell your partner or your family or friends or whoever you're close to uh, how you actually feel. Uh, there, it is not a weakness. Um, let them know how you feel. Um, and, um, you know, there are so many resources like uh, support groups and communities and uh, even your organization has so many resources, right, to help people who are going through this traumatic experience. So um, you have all these resources around you now, now more than any time in the history. You have all the resources out there and all the experts out there. But the thing is, you need to ask for help. And, you know, a lot of us think that oh, we uh, we have to not talk about mental health, um, you know, because it's quite a taboo, right? So uh, you actually, um, actually um, mental health, as I said, mental health takes a huge hit as well. And don't be afraid to ask for help. And there are so many people who would be willing to, um, you know, help you, who'd, who could give you solutions, or, or if not solutions, at least be empathetic um, and could guide that is you. the word, yeah, empathetic, empathy. Yeah, empathetic, and they can guide you, And but you have to be willing to ask for it. Yes, that is the message. That is what we want from everybody out there. They need to know that they're not alone. They need to know that. Yeah, in this journey. Need to know that. They need to. So, So, yes. Sorry. No, you go ahead. You go ahead. You go ahead. Yeah, so in my, um, uh, in the, in my book, so uh, the, according to the research, right? So people who go through a huge traumatic experience, any kind of trauma, um, the people who recovered and who were able to grow from that trauma had uh, a very good social support. It was the number one reason for uh, recovery and growth after a hugely traumatic incident. Uh, so yeah, for some of them, it was friends and family, for some even blogging, like where they could connect with people, um, online community. So that social support was very vital to recovery and growth for their mental health. So yeah, that's what I wanted to add. <laughs> Sorry. You, you've actually added everything that the body goes through and what the mind goes through. I'm, I'm so excited <laughs> about uh, checking out your book now. <laughs> <laughs> I can send you a copy. <laughs> oh. <laughs> let, let me know if you, yeah, we can probably, it's still recording. So, but let me know if you want like a physical copy or an ebook. I can send you one of it. Uh, it's available in India as well. So, I can uh, send it to you. <laughs> wow. Thank you so much. Thank you. But I have to thank you for being here today with us, taking the time out from your entire busy schedule so willingly, so enthusiastically, and so energetic. That is, that is the word. You're so energetic. It resonates in the way you talk, in the way you're conversing and there's so much energy in you. Like I can, it, it, it really is touching me. So that is why I'm saying this also. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dana, 
from onco.io and love heals cancer i really want to thank you on their behalf as well uh, it, this this video is going to help so many people out there inspire so many people watching how you beat cancer twice not just once but twice and doing it while doing it you you went through your phd as well that is no small feat that is something it really is thank you so much for taking the time out it was such so a pleasure for, talking thank you so much for the opportunity <laughs> uh i hope um, my story and this interview helps people thank you so much definitely definitely it was such a pleasure talking to you it was such a pleasure you, talking to you yeah. <laughs> same here thank you anyway have a nice day take care yeah. have a nice day keep inspiring all of us here keep inspiring doing what you do yeah Yeah, I'm sorry about the video quality because I didn't know it was a video. I thought you're gonna transcribe it. So um, and um, yeah, so I'm I'm really sorry about that. I hope it was okay, uh, the video quality. But yeah. not sure at all. Yeah. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Nice day. Bye. Take care. Bye bye. Mm -hmm.